Good morning, everybody. Pastor Mike here with another Watchman Pure Bible Study, Revelation chapter 13, dealing with the identity, the methods of the false prophet, how to spot him. If you remember from last week, uh, we started on this and we were looking at 1 Samuel 28, 11, where the, the, um, the woman, the witch of Endor, Endora, from Bewitched, saw gods coming up out of the earth. And the, it looked like an old man with a mantle over his head. And, and I told you to remember, there's a tarot card with that on there. There is a, um, uh, the album, The Stairway to Heaven, okay? Has that, you'll see it. Some of you are going, yeah, that's like wild. Um, he literally comes out of the earth. He is a beast. beast. He has a beast nature, and that brought us to um, 2 Peter 2.12. These is natural brute beast. Jude 1, um, what they know naturally is brute beast. So when the Bible's telling you this beast coming up out of the earth, just believe it. Instead of you trying to decipher this hidden code language that's in the Bible, just just believe what it says. It's, a, it's actually easier for you. I believe that a beast is going to rise up out of the sea, Revelation 13, 1, and then another one, out of the earth. I believe these are spirits that are, that are guiding men. This spirit in particular is guiding all mankind toward receiving a mark in the right hand or forehead and making an image to the beast and worshiping it. That's, that's his goal, that's his purpose, all right? So we did a little preliminary study in 2 Peter 2 and Jude 1 to kind of show you um, what to look for here. I wanna, we're gonna go back to 2 Peter and Jude. We're gonna, we're gonna dissect it. We're gonna look at exactly how God tells us from the New Testament how to spot uh, a false prophet, because there are many false prophets now. How can, we know who's, how can we know who's telling the truth? They say that they talk to God. How can we know that? They say they had a dream or a vision. How can we, how can we even know they had a dream or a vision? Legally, I, I've watched court shows and things like that. Legally, one person standing here cannot testify of what's in somebody else's mind. We don't know that. We have no way of knowing that today at least. And so how do we know people are telling us the truth? How do we know people are lying? We have a more sure word of prophecy. We're going to go back to the Old Testament. We're going to, God's going to show us how um, to spot and understand um, false prophets, how to spot them, how to know them, how to know if they're telling the truth or not, all right? Uh, we go back to Deuteronomy chapter 13. You can turn your Bible back there, read along with me. I'll be reading, I'll be using the King James throughout the rest of my life, and uh, you just follow along with me. That way you open your Bible, and you'll know that what I'm reading to you is the absolute truth. See, that's the, God makes it easy for us. How can I know he's telling the truth? Well, what he said contradicted the Bible, so therefore he's a liar and the Bible's right. All right? Oh, I told you last week, if you watched last week, if you want to know how a false prophet rests scripture, twists scripture, Go read and study the book of Galatians, read it all the way through, make little notes on it, key passages, and then watch a Jim Staley video on the book of Galatians. Because I guarantee, I guarantee you, when he reads to you the book of Galatians, he will try to convince you that you have to go back and keep the Old Testament law in order to be safe. All right? That's how they, they rest script, make it say what I want it to say, rather than what it says. Nobody ever reading the book of Galatians by itself ever closed Galatians and said, I think I need to go be circumcised in order to be saved. Said no Christian ever. All right. So this is how to spot them. He's telling you New Testament. He's telling us Old Testament how to spot them. First sign of, of a false prophet. Here, and, and we see that in Revelation 13. This is what he does. Let's go, let's go after these other gods. First sign. Causing people to change their God. Let me explain that. The God that I believe in is the God identified verbatim in this Bible. All right? That's the God that I believe in. Every word that describes God, the Holy Spirit, and Jesus Christ from this book, that's the God that I believe in. They will try to get you to go from this God here that's in this Bible 
to another God that has been carved out of their imagination or a plurality of deities, plurality of, of angels, ascended masters, gods, devils, saints. I'll show you how this works here in a little bit. Let's look at it. Deuteronomy 13, 1. If there arise you, among you a prophet, you know what? I got I to gotta stop right here. I got to stop right here. This is so cool. Deuteronomy 13, Acts 13, Revelation 13. What do you hear there? Do you hear what I hear? It's a 13, isn't it? 13 is the number for the love of God, the, the exact phrase, love of God 13 times, King James Bible, all right? The charity chapter, it's 1 Corinthians 13, isn't it? Okay, and um, that's God's pure love. God's love gives without an expectation of giving back. That's pure love, don't forget that. There's harlot love, mystery, Babylon the great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. 13 words there. Harlot love says, I love you if you give me money, or I'll do for you if you pay me, or I'll love you if you love me back. That's harlot love is what it is. A lot of, a lot of marriages, a lot of marriages are based upon unpure love. I will love you as long as you love me back or give me what I want. But if you don't, then I don't love you anymore. See how that is? Anyway, that's the number 13. That tells you what spirit is behind this. It's the spirit of mystery, Babylon the great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. All right? <clears throat> anyway, had to throw that in. If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and giveth thee a sign or a wonder. In Revelation, I should have kept my... I should have kept my uh, bookmark here. Revelation 13, it says, He doeth great wonders. If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and give thee a sign or a wonder. This prophet's going to give everybody a wonder. And it's really cool when you look at it from the Bible, what he's going to do here. Whew, wow. Can't wait to get there, but we'll have to. Anyway, this is a match here. This is... This is this mated with this. They're mated together. They say virtually the same thing. He's warning us about a false prophet who shows wonders. And here, God said, if there arise among you, they'll be in Christian churches. Now, I mentioned this last week. They'll be in pulpits. They'll be in blogs. They'll be in Christian magazines. They'll, they'll be in everything that is related to Christianity and maybe Judaism. They'll be there, all right? If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and giveth thee a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder come to pass. Wow, how is that possible? I think that devils, I think there are devils that inspire false prophets to give a sign and the devils carry out the sign. I think that's what happens, all right? Um, how else could a, a mortal human being um, say, I'm getting a prophecy from the Lord in less than one minute from now, there's gonna be a semi-truck and a Volkswagen meet head on right outside in front of the church, they're gonna crash. 10 seconds later, boom, they hear it. People rush out the door and there's a semi and a Volkswagen head on crash right in front of the church. They're gonna look back at that guy and they're going, there's no way he could cause that. How did, he, must, he must have known that. He's a, he's a seer, he's a man, he hears from God. Let's hear what else he has to say. That's how it works. Okay, the spirits tell him what to say. He says it, whammo, the wonder comes to pass. He says, have I got your attention now? See how it works? Men throughout history are fooled by charlatans gimmicks, magic tricks, seances, getting in touch with Uncle Harry. Um, they fall for this stuff. They're people of simple minds. They, they want to believe in something. They just don't want to believe the Bible. But they'll, they'll believe in something else, especially if you give them a sign or a wonder. 
the sign or a wonder, I believe will cause even the skeptics, even the f nuclear physicist, to believe in spirits and to believe in the other world and to believe in gods and so on. So that's, that's what it happens. He said the sign of the wonder is going to come to pass just because they pretend to do miracles or really do miracles. That doesn't mean from, they're from God. That's what he's telling you. And the wonder come to pass, the sign of wonder come to pass, wherever he spake unto thee, saying, let us go after other gods which thou hast not known. Let us serve them. Plural gods. Um, think of astrology. Astrology is gods. You're following the gods. You're following stars. Um, Roman Catholicism follows after multiple gods. You have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, God the Virgin Mary. You have God the Saint Joseph, God the Saint Agnes, God the Saint Matthias, God the Saint Ignatius de Loyola, God the Saint Mother Teresa. And, and the Catholic Church is full of signs and wonders, statues of Mary weeping, statues of Jesus with blood coming out of the hands and stuff like that. And everybody's going, oh, that's Maria. Oh, that's, and they fall for that stuff. They fall for the signs. Of, that's a sign from God right there. Oh, we're supposed to fall down and worship that. A la I kid you not. I remember seeing this as a young man. A lady on, I can't I remember, saw it on the news or something like that. She left a tortilla too long on the skillet. When she picked it up, it looked like an image of Jesus on there. So she built a shrine around it and she was charging people. People were coming from all over the place to bow to her tortilla. I didn't. I'm not paying her a dollar, 50 cents, two dollars, ten dollars. I'm not paying her. I'm not going to go and go. Oh, that's Jesus right there, the tortilla. Anyway. The, the sign here given, the false prophet rises up among them. He's one of their people, one of their kind. And he wants them to change their God, change it from, from this Bible to anything outside of this Bible. That's the sign that you're dealing with right there, all right? People will fall for the, for the wonders, for the signs and things like that. And then all you got to do is tell them, now this is, this is what the Pope says to do, or this is what Benny says to do, or this is what whoever says to do, all right? People fall for the signs. But this is what he says. Let's go after God's other gods which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet. If they're saying something that contradicts this book, you don't. Listen to them. Now remember, last week, um, I mentioned to you that I'm going to give you all of the signs from what I can see from the Bible, how to spot false prophets. Just because somebody you think qualifies under one of these, that may or may not mean that they are a wolf in sheep's clothing or a false prophet. And, and sometimes people, I think the word heretic is thrown around way too loosely. People come up with their own set of ideas about what the, they think the Bible's saying, and anybody who disagrees with them, even to like one degree to the left, they're a heretic. I've been accused of being a heretic and so on. If I, if, if I say we're going to go after other gods, it, you know what, it, I probably am. I don't see how anybody could read the Bible and believe that, and I don't. Um, and I don't serve three gods, by the way. I serve one. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. That's who I serve. These three. I, do I understand it? No. Do I believe it? Absolutely. I believe everything the Bible says. Be careful even of how people teach about the Godhead because 
I don't understand it. I don't think anybody really does un- completely comprehends the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. But I believe when Jesus came out of the water, the, God the Father said, this is my beloved Son, and the Holy Ghost lit on his shoulder like a dove. Obviously, there's three, and yet they are one. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. So that's what I believe. So I try to limit what I say, and as far as doctrine is concerned, I try to limit what I say to exactly the way the Bible says it. That way you're never wrong. All right? But obviously here, they're going after other gods which thou hast not known. They are, it is a god, a deity, or a multiple of gods that are not the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They're not the God whose son is Jesus Christ. This is real simple. Allah is not the same God that we worship. That's stupid. That's what makes me mad. It makes me mad to see so-called church leaders stand up in front of the people that they lord over and convince them that Allah is the same God as the one we worship. That makes me angry. There's a first sign. you got a wolf right there, a, a false prophet. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. Now watch this. This is what made me sit back one day, and I was reading this. I went, wow. For the Lord your God proveth you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. God said, I'm going to, I'm going to test you. I'm going to prove you. Why do these televangelists, why do all these false prophets, why are they so rich? Why are they so popular? Why, are they, why, are they have, why do they have the following they do? Because God sent them here to test us to find out that God is using them. Babylon has been a golden cup in the Lord's hand. Anybody who was willing to drink from that cup, there God's got them marked. He knows who they are now. Now he's, now he's separated out the sheep from the goats. That's why he uses these false prophets. He said, you shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments. There it is right there. That means his word, his Bible, his law, Old and New Testament and obey his voice, and ye shall serve him and cleave unto him like a wife would cleave unto her husband. And that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he he has spoken to turn you away from the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt and would redeemed you out of the house of bondage to thrust thee out of the way which the Lord thy God commanded thee to walk in. So shalt thou put the evil away from the midst of thee. God was... uh, Now, obviously, obviously, today... We would go to jail for shooting Benny Hinn, okay? We would go to jail for that, so don't do that. Let God take care of it. God's the one that raised Hinn and Hagen and Copeland and Joyce Myers and and Bill Hybels and Rick Warren and Joel Osteen and all of these other false, fake um, um, Dr. Awar in Kenya. God raised all these people up. Why? To, To show who's on whose side. You drink out of the cup of Babylon, you're a drunk. You go over here with the goats. You're full of the Holy Spirit, which means full of the Bible. You're a sheep. Come over here with the other sheep. God's using them to separate people out. All right? What is the devil trying to do? Get us all together. It ain't working with me. Um, Anyway, and by the way, consider this. At no time did God ever lead Israel back into Egypt, back into bondage. God doesn't ever lead us back into bondage. The Hebrew roots people do. Seventh-day Adventists do. Roman Roman Catholics do. Most every other cult is going to have some some form of bondage attached to it. Even the word faith movement, which is always full of, if you're not rich yet, you're not doing it right. If you're not rich yet, like I am, and successful like I am, if you're still sick, then obviously you're doing something wrong. That's another form of bondage. It's bondage that you're not performing well enough to meet God's standards. It's bondage. God didn't lead you into that. He brought you out of that. You beat yourself up before you came to the Lord trying to be better, and you couldn't be better. So why is it that we think, or we're being made to think, that now that we're on God's side and we're following Christ, that we still have to make ourselves better? It's bondage. Let God do it. He'll do a better job than you will anyway. So shalt thou put away the evil uh, from the midst of thee. So that's, that's the first sign right there. There's many things here. Anyway, going after angels or going after saints and so on. Then we have in Deuteronomy 18, there's a couple things here that we're going to look at. 
God gives us in Deuteronomy 18. Wow, what's well, way down here, isn't it? In Deuteronomy 18, um, he gives the idea of um, how to how to understand whether it's a prophet or not. And he's simply, simply put, if the prophet's ever wrong, it's not a prophet. If he prophesies in advance of something and declares this is gonna happen, and he does it, let's say he does it 100 times, 99 times he's right. If he's wrong one time, God said, I didn't send him. I didn't send him. See, God's in control of those devils that are making all these prophecies come to pass, and I guarantee you, God's gonna make one or two of them, a couple of them, not come to pass. And then the guy will say, well, you know, God changed his mind. God said, ah, no, that's not me. Anyway, God, God will make sure it happened. But on our way to Deuteronomy 18, I thought, I thought we should stop here. And uh, I'm going to begin to go through some of these. This is another way of spotting whether you are uh, part of in a false cult, you're in a false church, you're, um, uh, you're following a false leader, a false teacher, a false prophet of some kind. Because in Deuteronomy 18, after, you know, before God tells them, the prophet is always right, that's who you follow. He then gives them a list of forbidden practices, forbidden rituals, forbidden religious ideas that should never be amongst his people. We, I call it the list of forbidden practices. I did... I watched my broadcast years ago on this. I might revisit it again, but we're, we're going to go through them, and um, we're going to look at we're going to look at how these things ended up in the church. So the first sign it calls you to change the God of the Bible. The God that they follow is not the God. I'm going to throw this in here. Um, I am working on a series of watching my broadcasts called the Capstone. Capstone is that all-seeing eye on the back of the dollar bill over the pyramid. Everybody knows who that is. That's the Antichrist. That's his eye. That's the idol shepherd whose right eye has been put out. That's very clear to me. Nowhere in my King James Bible does it ever refer to Christ as the Capstone. Never, 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 never. It doesn't even, doesn't even hint at it. He is specifically mentioned as the cornerstone of the foundation. That's on the bottom, not on the top. Okay? NIV calls him capstone twice. So do some other people who follow after wrong doctrine that's not biblical and teachers who will try to convince you that the pyramid is a good sign and that Christ is the capstone on top of that pyramid. That's not in your Bible. Why believe it? Why? It's not there. The Bible actually teaches you the opposite. Don't believe it. I don't, I don't, I don't believe it because it's not my Bible. And I, I have been preached against. I've been slandered. I've been called names. Heretic is one of them. I refuse that doctrine. I refuse it. I won't believe it. That Jesus is the capstone. That's a lie. Anyway, change. If the God that I serve is the chief cornerstone of the foundation, not the capstone at the top of the pyramid. First sign. Cause you to change who the God is, who your God is, all right? First sign. Then we have a list of forbidden practices. Deuteronomy 18, verse 9. When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. And the Jews said, right, God, we're with you. And they walked in and they went, what's that guy doing? That looks cool. Look at those. Look at that stuff in their temples. Wow, that's pretty. You mean you guys get to do that in your religious services? Oh, oh, oh. And God said, don't learn it. And they said, okay, God. And they went in and they learned it. It's called the Kabbalah. They say it's Yahweh and Shekinah. It's not. It's, well, it may be. I don't know who Yahweh is. Yahweh and Shekinah is really Baal and Ashtaroth. They learned it. 
Anyway, verse 10, there should not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through fire or that useth divination or an observer of times or an enchanter or a witch or a charmer or a consulter with familiar spirits or a wizard or a necromancer for all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. Because of these abominations, the Lord thy God does drive them out from before thee. God said these are abominable practices that I don't ever want to see you doing. I don't want to see, I don't want to catch you doing it. I don't want you to learn it from these people. They have their, their religion is all about devils and devil worship it. They call them gods. These are devils. God said, I don't want you worshiping them. I'm jealous. I'm a jealous God. When I espoused you, I, I believe that you should be faithful and loyal to your one husband, me. You go whoring after these other gods, I'm going to cast you out. So let's break this down. First thing he said, and, and here's what you don't do. Don't think of the ancient archaic, this is how they used to do it principle. Remember, this Bible is present truth. Yeah, they used to take their babies and put them on Molech and you know, they could hear the, their burning babies and so on. Let's understand that I have never been to a church service where they said, hand us your babies, we're going to burn them on the altar. Never been to that church service. I have, however, seen church services where they make people pass through fire. Bill Johnson, the anti-Bethel church in Redding, California. There's a YouTube video. You go look this up. It's called the Fire Tunnel. In Bill Johnson's church, they have everybody have all these people in line, two lines, and they're making this tunnel. And the people will pass through. They call it the fire tunnel. They're passing through the fire to get to the other side. This is a ritual that, they're, that God told them to perform. Where? Where? Where is that? Show me where in this Bible God tells them to perform this ritual. In order to get to the other side, once they're on the other side, they've had the enlightenment or they have the full, they have the full anointing uh, of the Holy Spirit or they have the fresh fire or anything like that. Watch these things. Watch for the rituals. I'm going to say this. Be very, very suspicious of any fire-based ministry. Be suspicious of it. Um, uh, Todd Bentley references that. Uh, Benny Hinn, they all talking about this fire anointing, fire anointing. Everything's on fire. We're going we're gonna to burn the world up. Um, the uh, United Pentecostals, um, I think their publishing company is World of Flame. World of Flame. You know how, where they got that from? The book of James where it talks about how evil the tongue is and it sets the whole world on fire. And they go, yeah, hallelujah, praise God. We got tongues and we're going to burn the world down with it. Watch out for that. Watch out. Be suspicious of any fire-based teaching or ministry. Be very suspicious of it. All right? Um, divining. I'm just kind of going through the list here. He said, uh, make your, children, your son or your daughter to pass through the fire. It's being done. Being done. In a ritualistic, symbolic way, it's being done. I wouldn't do it if I were you. All right? Number two, that uses divination. Divination is trying to discern a, a sign from God using like nature signs. Uh, there are those that always point out certain signs everywhere, and then they give a false meaning. Okay, somebody says, yeah, man, the other day it was like real weird because this guy came in to McDonald's and he was like dressed in a suit of armor, you know, and it's like, man, I'm going, what does this guy do? He's like, you know, like, is there a, a war convention somewhere or something like that? And the guy goes, oh, man, because like God's telling me right now, this is a sign to you. God has, God has given you the concept of a warrior and and that guy wearing that suit of armor, God wants you to know that that's the suit of armor that you're to put on. You're to put on the spirit and he'll protect you as you go out. I mean, I'm, I'm, I made all of that up just now. Okay, pretty good, isn't it? Okay, that, listen, that's a sign, man. God wants you to know something. Watch out for these people. Diviners, everything's a sign. Everything that happens, oh, wow, wait, hang on. God's telling me something right now. Man, this is a sign right here, okay? 
I mean, look at, diviners would take like the tea grains in the bottom of a cup and look at them and go, okay. In the Bible, they mentioned looking at the liver. I haven't really studied that out, but apparently the diviners used to take out some kind of liver and they would split it open and look at it and say, oh man, the signs are right here. This is what's going to happen. Okay. I mean, that's what divination is. They're using nature signs or they're always pointing out, oh, that's a sign from God right there, man. That's a sign from God. Even your friends will do it. Some, something happened to you and your friends are going, do you think that's a sign from God? Do you think God's trying to tell you something? And I'm going, well, if he is, I'm sure that I'll read it in the Bible somewhere. I'm sure I will. Watch out for that, okay? An observer of times. You ready? Fixing to get, I'm fixing to open up a great big can of worms and a can of King James, okay? Fresh can of King James Bible on those who observe times. I'm going to quote scripture to you. I'm going to quote scripture. Galatians chapter 4. In Galatians, Paul dealt specifically with those who went after the law. And in Galatians chapter 4, verse 9, Paul says, But now, after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements, whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage. Ye observe days and months and times and years. Paul said that those who observe times are in bondage. Jim Staley, he said it. His statement was, I just believe that when we observe times on Yahweh's calendar, that a portal is opened up between us and heaven. You know, he's setting everybody up to believe. He's setting everybody up to believe that if they go and perform or pretend in their minds that they're performing the Old Testament feast days, that they will be actually have a closer connection between them and God and those other Sunday worshiping people who don't do it. The pagan Roman Greek paganized King James Bible believers. They don't have this neat thing with God. But when we observe times, he used that language on Yahweh's calendar, then we have this special unique connection with Yahweh that no one else has. He's setting you up, people. He's an observer of times. He is an observer of times. He is a false prophet, and he's trying to put you back in bondage again. They're right there in the church, people. And Jim Staley is trying, him and um, Joseph Fair of World Net Daily are trying to bring the Hebrew roots into mainstream. Sid Roth is doing it. They're trying to get everybody back to Mount Sinai bondage. You don't believe me? Go read Galatians. You want to see how scripture is rested? Go read Galatians and watch Jim Staley's commentary on Galatians. You'll just go, uh, Jim, that's not what it said. That's not what it said. It didn't say that. No, no, Bible doesn't say that. Then we have an enchanter. An enchanter is a spellcaster or a cursor. Not someone who says blankety, blanket, blanket, blank, I'm blanking out of time, blankety, blank. Not somebody like that. Someone who's always cursing everybody. I curse you in Jesus' name. I'm cursing you. I'm going to curse you. If you come against me, I'll curse you in Jesus' name. You hear people like that? They're always cursing people. All right? Someone, an enchanter, is someone who believes that their words hold special power. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Joyce Myers. Power thoughts. She writes a book called The Answer is Right Under Your Nose. She means your lips. She believes that if you say the right things, if you pronounce things, then these things will come to pass. If you say them often enough with enough, with enough force, faith force behind it. I knew a young lady that worked for her, and I heard her. She, had, she worked for her for a time, and then she didn't work there anymore, which happens to a lot of people that work for her. And uh, she said that uh, she, she made something, and I heard her say, oh, that was a negative confession. I shouldn't have said that. And I'm going, where'd you get that from? That's, that's like casting spells. You think like your words will have the impact that you say. Like if I say, man, I tell you what, I laughed so hard I about died. 
oh, that was a negative confession. I just took 10 years off my life. These people actually believe that nonsense. That's an enchanter. Okay? They actually believe that their words hold special power. They're, the idea is related to a charmer. That word is the word where we get cantata, canticle, and cantor. You know what a cantata is? It's a, it's a musical piece with words. All right? um, a canticle is a song with words, lyrics in it, and so on. You know where I'm going. Repetitive music is an enchanter. Especially when our Savior told us, do not go the way the heathens do. I think I have this down here somewhere. I'll probably run onto it a little bit. He said, don't, don't do what the heathens do with vain repetitions. They think that God can hear them through their much speaking. And you'll hear this. You'll hear the repetitive nature of those who are chanters in the church who are trying to convince you that you need to say it over and over again. A friend of mine who was, um, he met the Lord in a United Pentecostal church, but they, being saved wasn't good enough. Coming down to the altar and, and confessing Jesus, that wasn't good enough. You've got to speak in tongues, and if you don't, you're not saved. So they stood him up. You know what they made him do? Say hallelujah. So he said it. They said, say it again. Hallelujah. Again, hallelujah. Faster, 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 until his tongue got tied and stuff started coming out. And they said, woo! It's a setup, people. They're enchanters. They, they thought that by the repetitious nature of him saying these words, that the Holy Ghost then would then pay attention, wake him up out of his sleep, pay attention, and come down upon him. And a guy like me will just tell you, I believe that if you pray one time about something and God knows your heart, God will answer it. One time. I've done it before. Prayed about something one time, forget about it. All of a sudden, God did it. God reminded me. I went, God, you're good to me. Watch out for enchanters. Repetitive music and lyrics. Gregorian chants. Roman Catholic Church monasteries are based upon repetitive chants that they think brings in God. Vain repetitions. Here it is, Matthew 6, 7. But when you pray, use not vain repetitions. As the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. In the church are enchanters, either by word or by lyric or by song. They are enchanters. They believe that repetitiveness, uh, saying it over and over and over and over and over again, will then bring down the power of God or the stillness of God or whatever it is. Watch out. It's a setup. Contemplative prayer is based upon enchanters. You become the enchanter in that you repeat the Lectio Divina, the divine lectionary or the divine word. You, they, they tell you that if you repeat it over and over and over without any thought whatsoever, that pretty soon you'll be talking directly to God without the mediator, Jesus Christ. It's an abomination, people, and it's in the church. All right. Uh, more information on that, Lighthouse Trails Research. They devote in their entire ministry to uncovering contemplative prayer inside of the church. This is something you look for. I talked to a lady one time, she called several years ago. She was telling me about what was going on in church. They took out the church pews. They were um, you know, putting the sermons up on the wall. Nobody brought their Bibles anymore, all this stuff. And I said, and I, and I told her, I said, this is, let me, I said, let me tell you this. I said, your pastor's gonna start talking about a building program, locking in about a five to $10 million debt. And she said, yep, yeah, he's, he's done that. And I said, then he's going to start introducing to you a prayer practice whereby you chant, repeat over and over and over until you go into a trance and you're going to communicate directly with God. And she said, he talked about that last Sunday. I said, get out. That man's hearing from a familiar spirit. He's not hearing from God. He's hearing from a familiar spirit. If he wants to hear from God, let him read the Bible. But anyway, that's what an enchanter is. Let me, um, let me, let me cover one more and then we'll... we'll um, We'll hold off on the rest of this because I got a lot to give you on just Deuteronomy 18, all right? And I want us to understand the false prophet isn't just one set of rules or one set of principles. They come in multiple ways, every way. When they say all roads lead to the same God, that is partially true. 
All other roads lead to the same God, but there is only one path to the real God, and that is Jesus Christ, period, the end. So let me deal with this, all right? He told him, he said, um, not to make your son or daughter pass through the fire, use divination or observer of times or an enchanter or a witch. All right, he said that in verse 10. A witch in the church, let me tell you what it looks like. It looks like female domination, female dominion. That's what it looks like. It's a woman behind the pulpit. That's all you need to know. You can stop right there and say, nope, sorry, I'm not going to church here. I don't, don't send me your tapes. I'm not going to listen to your YouTube uh, videos. I'm not going to listen to you. You're clearly wrong. I'm out. Well, I've got a guy in our church that took 1 Corinthians 14 to his Assembly of God pastor, and he said, Pastor, you've got women up there preaching. You've got women speaking tongues all over the church. He didn't have a mean spirit. I mean, I know the guy. He said, what about what it says in 1 Corinthians 14? In the direct connotation of speaking in tongues in the church, let the women keep silent, for it is not permitted unto them to speak. Pastor said, that's not for us. Did you catch it? The Bible said it. He took it out, set it aside, and said, see, now it's gone. It's gone. See, it's not there anymore. He took it out of the Bible. I, I'm not the man's judge. I can't do that. My conscience, if I said, now this, this next part here in verse 10 where it talks about which, don't worry about that. That's not for us. Don't, don't believe that. Don't have to worry about that. I can't do that. That's what it says. Female dominion. So any church pastored by a woman solely or a man and wife as pastors, that's a witch. Mark it down. You know how I know? She's blatantly, him and her both are blatantly disobeying and disregarding the pastoral qualifications for a bishop and the rules for church service where the woman is not permitted to speak. She's not to usurp authority over the man. Beth Moore is a witch. Joyce Myers is a witch. Under that clause, they're witches. All right? Female dominion. You say, well, I need more. They will use elemental magic. They will use magic. They will cast spells. They will say that your words, just like an enchanter, your words can produce the things that you want if you say them the right way. They use spell casting. And I mentioned elemental magic. That is invoking earth, air, fire, and water. There's actually churches called element churches. They're actually Sunday school literatures called Elements, Elements Worship for Kids. Free Will Baptist puts that out. It ain't right. They, where did they get that from? They didn't get it from the Bible. If, if anything, if anything, the word elements in the King James Bible is weak and beggarly elements. Why should we have anything to do with it? But then they'll talk about north, south, east, and west. We're going to point to the gods that are over here, over here, over here, and over here. Remember what Deuteronomy said, 13, going after other gods. The four elements are four different, unique spiritual entities or gods that must be invoked together to perform the magic while you're inside the magic circle. Honey, the circle drawer. Um, Mark um, uh, can't, uh, Batterson. Uh, I think is his name, writing this book about drawing circles everywhere. That's elemental witchcraft is what it is. Um, elemental magic, spell casting, using certain words that, quote, invoke a power. God's not invoked. He is provoked. But he is, you don't say words that get God's attention. Okay? You know what gets God's attention? Broken and contrite heart. Not saying magic words. A lot of church services, a lot of... Uh, what I call uh, liturgical church services, begin with an invocation. We beseech thee, O Lord, and they're reading the prayer, and that's supposed to get, okay, God, God, you can go now. They said the words uh, that invoke a power, uh, power words, positive thinking, etc. Let me, let me dispel that doctrine with two verses. Let me kick that doctrine right out the door with two verses. The idea that you must say the right words or God will not give you what you ask for, or you must think it, you must say it, and release it, or God won't do it for you. Let me show you two verses that kick that doctrine out the door. Romans 8, 26. Likewise the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. 
We don't know what to pray for. <sighs> Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh the intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. And I've had people say, well, yeah, that's why I pray in tongues, because it's the groanings that cannot be uttered. Well, hold on a minute. It didn't say groanings that you wouldn't understand that would be uttered. It said groanings that cannot be uttered, which basically it essentially means you can't say it. You can't utter it. It is impossible for you to say the right things. Impossible. Let me read it again. The Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. God, the Holy Ghost, prays a prayer better than you do. Ephesians 3.20, Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. Did you catch that? He is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. So who taught you that you had to think the right way and ask the right things and say the right word? Who taught you that? Not the Holy Spirit, not the Word of God. God didn't tell you that. God told you you didn't know what to pray for. God told you that God is not dependent on you saying the right words and believing the right way. God said you're not even capable of it. Which, by the way, I'm able to give you more and better than you ask or think. I, I have, I'm making a mental list of prayers that I prayed where God answered them way better than I thought. One of them was my brother-in-law. I prayed for him to be saved, and I had it in my mind that I'd be sitting on his deathbed as he's drawn his last breath saying, Steve, please, I want to hear you pray to the Lord. That's how I had it figured. God, pray, God did it better than that. God brought him up to us. He lost his wife. He lost his home. He lost it. He had nothing. He didn't even have good health. And for about three months, he started coming back to church. And I could see a difference in him. I'd see him nodding his head, reading his Bible, listening to me. Amen, amen, amen. He comes to me. He came to me on a Sunday morning before church. And Mike, I'm going to know for sure that I'm going to heaven when I die. And I said, Steve, I can tell you, you are. I can see it all over you. But we prayed. And I said, God, you just let him know. That Friday, he died in his sleep. His son told me, he said, Mike, he said, the strangest thing. He said, I never know dad to be this way. He said, I'd just walk in his house and he'd be sitting there reading his Bible. And he'd want to show me things out of the Bible. He's trying to tell me, you know, I'm going to heaven when I die. I didn't pray it that good. I, I just a list of prayers that I've prayed that God answered way better than I've ever prayed them. I, I tell you, I don't like these people. I think they're putting people in bondage by when the prayer doesn't get answered, it's because they did something wrong. You're looking at a guy that does just about everything wrong, and God's still good to me. So I may, I may, uh, I may hurt your feelings or scald you in this teaching, and it's going to sound like I'm being mean and judgmental and harsh to everybody but myself. I'm telling you that I am under the same rules that you, you apply them to this ministry as I'm telling you to apply them to everybody else, okay? And if you think that if you think I'm wrong in one of these areas, listen to see if I'm wrong in any of the others, all right? That's what I'm asking you to do. Um, we're going to pick up with charming and con consulting familiar spirits and wizards. I'm telling you, they're all, if you learn how to spot them, they're all in the church. God already told us what to look for. We just didn't look. All right? I love you. It's good to be with you. Appreciate your prayers for us. And um, you keep praying for us. And pray that I don't ever fall under any of these categories. All right? God bless you. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.